Born Mark Bell in Brooklyn, Marky joined the Ramones in 1978. He was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2002, along with Johnny, Joey, Dee Dee, and Tommy, and has received both a Grammy and an MTV Lifetime Achievement Award. When punk rock reared its spiky head in the early 70s, he had the best seat in the house. Already a young veteran of the prototype American metal band Dust, Mark took residence in artistic CD Lower Manhattan, where he played drums in bands that would shape rock music for decades to come, including Wayne County, who pioneered transsexual rock, and Richard Hell and the Voidoids, who directly inspired the entire early British punk scene. And if punk has royalty, Mark became part of it when he was knighted Marky Ramon by Johnny, Joey, and Dee Dee. He promises to share lots of stories from his amazing life and career tonight. He's joined by Adine Vaziri, pop music critic for the San Francisco Chronicle. So please join me to welcome Marky Ramon and Adine Vaziri. Well, there you go again. <laughs> Hello, everybody. How you doing? Whoa. Well, there you go again. How are you? All right. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. You know, before we start asking the questions, I just wanted to talk about one of my favorite scenes in the book, which is uh, it's, it's later on in the band's... Um, career, you know, um, towards the end, and uh, Joey and Johnny haven't spoken to get to each other in about 15 years, and Joey's on Prozac, right? And he, you're sitting between them in the yes, van, yes. and he leans over to John after not talking to him all that time and says, and, and John's a huge baseball fan, so he goes, so he asks them, how do you think the Yankees are going to do yeah. this year? And, <laughs> yeah. wh and what did John say at that point? This was, this was a chance to make it all better, to become Well, I wish they would have. I mean, that was, uh, I mean, it definitely curbed his OCD, and it helped him with that, which, which was great. But he, uh, he, was, uh, he confronted John and said, how are the New York Yankees doing? So John just turned around because he knew it was the Prozac talking. But... Uh, but that would have been great because at that point, I, I think John should have at least, you know, let go of these petty animosities and just, you know, started talking to him. Instead, you know. he said. He just turned around and that was it. I know it's the Prozac talking. So, yeah. you know, it's, that's, uh, we were family, brothers, and that's what happens. You know, sometimes uh, people just don't get along, you know, and unfortunately, I, uh, fortunately, uh, I was able to get along with all of them, so you know it's that's that, important. That was you, always in the middle, always in between. Yeah, them. I was the buffer, you know, yeah. in between them, trying trying to do my best to to get them together to make up, you know. So. Did they pay you extra as their as a group therapist? Was uh, <laughs> no, I, I only got a general diploma. I went to night school and summer school, and which made up for the ten months I didn't go to high school. So I remember you talking about this book years ago. Um, when did you yes. actually start? Well, about five years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, it, I just had everything. You, when you write a book, you, you have to make it flow. So I'm not, I'm not saying just year by year, because a lot of books, it's oh, 1990, then it's 1992, 93. You've got to make the book flow, and you've got to make it sound like you. Uh, I went through three different writers. The first one had a nicotine habit. So the writer had to leave my uh, place every 10 minutes. It ruined the momentum. You know, she comes back and it's like, you know, you know, so that was it. Then the other one, you know, after reading the transcript of the second writer, it sounded like I had the King's English. Like, uh, you know, here I am, you know, at the, at the Knights of the Round Table, you know what I mean? And, uh, you know, art thou thee, and here comes, you know, the, you know, whatever, you know, the guy on his horse, you know. So, I, then Richard Hirschlag uh, uh, was introduced to me, and he, he, he was perfect. He got, he got the flow, my, uh, you, you know, the way I talk, you know. So, that, that took quite a, that was an experience. That took about five years. Yeah. But I think it worked out well that way because you 
by default have become the Ramon's official historian. I mean, you're the one who can tell all those stories and you're the only one that's really left that was there through it all. So it kind of worked out, the, the delay. And are you okay with that, with that role? Are you okay carrying that torch? Well, you know, the songs are too good not to be played, you know, and... <laughs> and you're in, a, you're in a van for 15 years on a rolling institution with wheels, and uh, you were doing 1,700 shows. You become very close to, to these other the bandmates, and they die too young to enjoy the fruits of their labor. So there's a whole new generation now, and uh, I enjoy playing the music. I, I tried you know, doing originals and having my own bands doing originals, but, but the kids and, the, and the, the older generation who stuck by us just wanted to hear Ramon songs. So I said, okay, you got it, you know? <laughs> so, you know, I, uh, as long as it's fun, I'll continue doing it, definitely. Um, I think the, the thing a lot of people are probably wondering, especially when they heard you wrote a book, is how did you remember any of this stuff? How did you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you, being in the Ramones, you can't forget, because of all the incidences that happened in this book, uh, I used to bring around a, a composition notebook from, that I used in school when I did go to school. And I have the uh, largest video library of the Ramones in the world. So if my memory didn't serve me correctly, I would just go back and look at certain things. But in the book, it's, it's all there and everything is, is true. May God strike me dead right now. <laughs> you know, so, you know, uh, I, I, I felt I had to do this, you know, so just to get it out. And you're, you're a collector. Were you, were you collecting back then as well? You were collecting the clips and the videos and all that? Oh, uh, yeah. I, I just enjoyed watching everything and how the fans would react in videos, which I apply now to my band to see how they react to certain songs. And then I put, that's how I put my set list together. So uh, it, it's very helpful. Um, so let's talk about w when you first joined the band. You, you, you were already playing around New York and they, they brought you in. What, what was that moment like when you became a part of the, the Ramones? What well, they used to come see my bands play that I had before I joined the Ramones, Richard Hell and the Vaudoids, a band called Dust. We, wanted, we were one of the first heavy metal bands in America, and they were in the audience. So that, I, you know, I found that out later. Hey, Mark, that band was good, blah, blah, blah. So we all knew each other in CBGB's. Uh, you know, with Blondie and Talking Heads, Ramones, Johnny Thunders, uh, David Johansson, um, you know, you name it. We were all in one little dump, which are called CBGBs. So uh, Tommy, the first drummer, who was in a band three and a half years, decided to produce, you know. That was his calling. And uh, he suggested to Dee Dee, who, was, uh, uh, who visited CBGBs probably every night, uh, and I was there every night, too. And uh, that's when Dee Dee popped the question, would you join the band? And I said, well, you know, thank you. Let's go to a rehearsal studio. I did three songs, I Don't Care, Sheena was a punk rock, Blitzkrieg Bob, and it worked out, and that was it. What, at that point, you were pretty, you were, on the scene, you were pretty well known as Mark Bell. Were you okay giving up your real name to become... This oh, yeah. yeah. Character, I, Marky Ramon. Well, Mark, this is how Marky came about. In the 60s, when I was a little boy, there was this cart cartoon that represented Ma Marky Mapo, Mapo cereal. And there was a hot bre breakfast food like Wheatina and Farina. This was Mapo. And my grandmother used to always call me Marky every minute. Marky, clean the stairs. Marky, uh, you know, uh, the driveway, this and that. So then, um, you know, I, uh, I said, all right, Marky. I, I dropped the C, put a K there, and the NOI, and that was it. But uh, that's where all that came from, my grandma and, and Marky Mapo. <laughs> was there a, did you experience like kind of a physical and emotional transformation through the name change as well? No, and it, it, you know, it, I, my bills are still Mark Bell. But I mean, uh, that's, that's the only difference. Uh, uh, you know, AKA Marky Ramon, you know. So uh, 
I w- it, at this point in my life, I'm, I'll stick with Marky Ramon. Was New York in the 70s um, as great as everyone seems to think? Because a lot of your fans are probably, you know, weren't even alive in the 70s. Um, so they, we, have all, we have all these romantic images of what it was like playing CBGBs and hanging around with all these other bands. In your memory, was it as uh, picturesque? I mean, was it as great as... It CBGB's was elongated. It was a, a rectangle. It was made out of wood, had a great PA. It didn't have any doors in the bathrooms. Uh, Hilly owned a dog that he didn't take out. So, you know, a lot of times you would slip on something. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's how it was. And uh, it, was, it was our place. At that time, 75, 76, uh, New York was very downtrodden. Uh, there was a lot of homeless people, unemployment. Uh, there, were, there were strikes uh, from, uh, you know, the garbage strikes. Uh, there was the blackout in 76, 77. And uh, we had our home, which was CBGB's. The, the problem was at the time we had, we also had Max's Kansas City, which was a great place too. Disco was big. Stadium rock was big. Nobody wanted to play our kind of music except CBGB's. Uh, they didn't want to gamble on a new genre of music. So we uh, were happy to have our home, you know. And Hilly was like a father figure. So uh, that, that's, that's what I remember about uh, that era and that time. And then eventually everything got gentrified like everywhere else. So, you know, it's, uh, that, that was the change, really, physically, uh, of the area. And what, what was your impression of the three other guys when you first joined? How long did it take you to think, what have I done? <laughs> like... Well, when I joined the group, I thought everyone was were like brothers, the Ramones, you know, where they got it from Paul McCartney. Paul McCartney was in a band called the Silver Beatles before the, uh, the Beatles. And uh, he called himself Paul Ramon because he thought it sounded exotic. But um, Dee Dee uh, realized that and got the name, and that's how everybody agreed upon it. And, you know, they, they all liked it, and that's how the band, the Ramones, came about. Like, like a gang, like a family, you know? So... Uh, you know, that, that's how that developed. And, and when you got in there, what did you make of all the well, personalities? Well, each individual, well, you know, you, gotta, you, you observe and you see, you, you know, you're stuck in this rolling 15-passenger uh, Ford Econoline van with no escape. And uh, you, you, you're driving five, six hours a day to get to each show. We weren't into that rock star, let's rent a, you know, a big tour bus with the driver, you know. So we had assigned seats, and uh, you know we uh, got to know each other very well. Uh, Johnny was was uh, basically the guy that kept the three other freaks in check. You know me, Dee Dee, and Joey. Uh, but John had his quirks too. You know we weren't per- we weren't angels. Uh, in fact, we were like aliens that landed from another planet. So, um, you know, Joey is very shy, introverted, and, uh, but what a great songwriter, you know, and a perfect, f- histor- you know, histrionic front man. And then Dee Dee was definitely a whirlwind hurricane. I mean, he made me laugh every minute. If you have somebody that makes you laugh every minute, stay friends with them for life. So uh, Dee Dee was the kind of guy you would be with him, and there'd be 10 people around us, and he'd just come out and say whatever he felt like saying. I mean, and then I'd have to go along with him or help protect him because a lot of the things he said were totally off the wall. But uh, that's, that's what was great about Dee Dee. He had a child, childlike, vivid imagination. And that's what he, he did in his songs because he was very creative when it came to that. So was Joey. And Tommy, uh, Tommy was a uh, very smart, very smart guy. He, uh, he was an engineer, then he produced. He never played the drums. He, he recorded those great three albums. And then he just decided to produce, you know? And to me, personally, I, I, loved, the, I loved those three those three great albums, and I loved the lineup. And I said to Dee Dee, are you sure he wants to leave? Yes. 
So uh, then I got into the band. The first song I recorded was I Want to Be Sedated with the group. So <laughs> who knew? <laughs> <laughs> Not a bad way to start. Uh, do you, when you see a Ford van drive by, do you, do you have a bad uh, flashbacks? No, uh, <laughs> I'm very grateful. Very grateful. You know, could have been a Dodge or could have been a Chevy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and were you friendly with all the other band members? Did you get along with them right well, away? Or um... well, you you're there to do a job. You, you have to, you have to get along. I mean, uh, we we were different individuals, um, and the Ramones were the most important thing to us. That sounds cliched, but that's what mattered. Any uh, animosities that were there, you know, that brothers usually have, families have. We left that off the stage. And maybe it helped our music, <laughs> you know, just because we were all different. And there's a saying, opposites attract. So maybe uh, if, if we weren't different like that, maybe the music would have been different. Who knows, you know. But uh, I got to know them all very well, and we all had our quirks and Difference, different difference of opinions about politics, about uh, you know whatever you know the, the events of the day, and so we were we were definitely unique individuals in that sense. Were you aware um, of the impact the band was going to have on rock and roll, and were you were you aware you guys were making a difference at the time that you, there were going to be bands that followed you? No, we just played. We just wanted to play the music we loved playing, you know, two, uh, three chords, two minutes, hopefully, not any longer. And, um, you know, with a nice hook, a good chorus, and that was it. You know, we liked the early rockers, Jerry Lee Lewis, Chuck Berry, Elvis, you know, all those guys. And then, of course, the British Invasion came along, Kinks, The Who, The Beatles, and, of course, the Phil Spector sound. So uh, you throw that up in the air, it lands, and it's a Ramones omelet, you know, so... You know, uh, we, we, we didn't know what we were doing at the time until later. You know, coming to each show again, each venue, seeing bands and, you know, the leather jackets and jeans and all this stuff, and one, two, three, four into each song and playing faster and, you know, moving around more instead of just standing in one spot. So, you know, we were very grateful that that band cited us as an influence. You know, uh, and a lot of bands won't tell you that, but the ones that did, we were we were very grateful to hear that. And you, uh, a lot of the uh, British punk bands kind of took what you were doing as the blueprint for what they did. But do you feel like they they got it right, or did they get it all wrong? Well, they uh, they were very political. Uh, the Sex Pistols album's great. The Clash did great things. There were a lot of good bands there. When the Ramones went there in 76 for the first time, they were on the audience watching. Uh, and, you know, the Ramones started in 74, late 74. These bands didn't start yet. But the Ramones definitely gave it a jolt when they went there, you know, especially to Sid, Sid Vicious and some of the guys in the clash and all that stuff. But there, there was a competitive camaraderie, you know, uh, in England at the time and, and in New York. Uh, they were living on the dole, which is the equivalent of welfare. And um, again, there, was, there, were, there were no jobs there f for the youth. And uh, a lot of people um, suffered from that. So uh, they had their bands, and then um, they, they sang about political things, which the audience, their audience could relate to. The, the punk scene in New York was mainly have a good time, forget your troubles, and enjoy the moment, you know, and that's what the Ramones were all about. Was there um, any point where you felt like you'd, you've, the Ramones had finally gotten across and that mainstream America was finally ready for what you were doing? Uh, in the beginning, DJs didn't want to play us, uh, probably because of the lyrical content. Uh, you know, I could bring up uh, certain songs or lyrical contents that, you know, they wouldn't want to play. But um, again, like I said before, disco was big and all that stuff and stadium rock and, you know, uh, you know, like... Uh, 
you know, uh, now I want to sniff some glue. You know what I mean? I don't think a DJ is going to play that. Uh, you know, things like that. Um, so eventually, uh, a lot of our fans became DJs, and they did start playing us. You know, they, uh, they got bold, and they started playing us, and then um, we started playing uh, a lot bigger venues, and, um, you know, we started touring the world more, so we amassed a large audience, and it became from underground to above ground. Uh, so, what, you know, once you sign your name to a contract, uh, all that other stuff comes, you know, the records and the T-shirts, so you are a commodity. You know, that, that's, you know, a lot of punk bands uh, don't think they are, but they are, because uh, we live in a capitalistic society. That's America. That's, that's what, we, that's, that guides our GNP, you know, which is the gross national product. So, uh, here I am. I, I, I should be on Fox News. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's, that's the uh, story. So, eventually, uh, now you see the Ramones being played at uh, football games, baseball games, commercials, this and that. So, you know, uh, Warner's, which is our parent label, uh, you get a, they, they have somebody reach them and they go, oh, we want to use a Ramon song in a commercial. So they say, uh, you know, they, they agree and they take 50%. A uh, record company usually takes 50%. And then whatever deal you have with the band, then we split that up, you know. So that's how that works, you know, with, with, a, with a commercial thing. And on the radio, it's uh, mechanicals and publishing. So that, that's, what it was, that's what it is. How did um, Rock and Roll High School change things for you? Was that? Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, well, we were very, very grateful to be in Rock and Roll High School. It was originally going to be called Disco High School. <laughs> so the thing was, uh, uh, Alan Arkish, our director, told Roger Corman, our producer, we, let's just call it Rock and Roll High School, get a bunch of guys that play rock music and put them in the movie. So originally, they were going to use Cheap Trick. But uh, the Ramones looked more, more, more like a band together as a unit. So uh, we, um, we, we toured our way from the east to west coast to do Rock Roll High School. So you wait around, you, you have your, you're there, you're there for six weeks, and then they ask you to do your part. You could sit there all day, your part's only five minutes. Uh, my big line in the movie was, gee, that was a good one, Mr. McGree. And, uh, <laughs> And I was very disappointed that I didn't win the Oscar. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, you know, we, looking at that movie, when it came out, and you're in it, and you see yourself on the screen, it's like, oh, God. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, a face only a mother could love. <laughs> you know, so uh, that, that was an experience. It got, that helped us get to the next level because of all the publicity surrounding it, you know? And there were great people in the movie, too. And of course, after that, working with Phil Spector, you know, that, that brought us a lot of attention. But uh, making a movie is very tedious, you know. But it turned out well for the budget that we had, and uh, that was the result, you know, keeps uh, being played today, you know. And um, I have to say, even if you guys don't have time to read the whole book, read the chapter on Phil Spector, because that, it's, it's, that, what an experience. Yeah, Can yeah. you tell them a little bit about what it was like working with Phil? You ended up becoming friends with him yeah, yeah. after all to, that. <laughs> to the end, yeah. Uh, well, he is probably the most famous, well-known producer in America. Uh, he made all those hits, and we always loved what he did. And there uh, was an experiment, two walls of sound meeting, whatever. And uh, Phil wanted to produce us. So uh, we met up at his mansion at the, at the time. He didn't have the castle yet. He just, he just had the mansion in Beverly Hills. So I walk in there with the other three guys, and who's sitting next to him talking? Grandpa Munster. <laughs> with, with cowboy boots on, a 10-gallon hat, and uh, Phil sitting at the piano. And here's me, Johnny, uh, Joey, and Dee, Dee with him. And uh, we were discussing, you know, the, the studio stuff and the demos he heard, what, 
little nuances that should be done, and et cetera. And then we all went to the studio. Phil never pointed a gun at us in the studio. That's, that's bullshit. Excuse the language. But, um, you know, it's a rumor. It, it sounds good. I don't want to break anybody's bubble, but he did have the guns on him. He had a license to carry, but he never pointed. That's a different story. When somebody points a gun at you, it's a little different. So he was about 5'5", five, five, and, and they were heavy. He took them off. And he had his bodyguard there that had a license to carry, too. So it was me, the other Ramones, Phil, and Larry Levine, his trusty engineer for, since he started in the business. So uh, the, only, the only thing that I noticed that was a little grating to, to us was when Johnny uh, had to do that chord to the, to the beginning of Rock and Roll High School, which Phil wanted him to do over and over again. Not, 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 not to break his you-know-what, but uh, he wanted to have a certain sustain on the guitar, which he wasn't getting on his Mose right. Phil suggested a Les Paul, but John didn't want to use it. So we waited and waited, and we heard that chord over and over again. And eventually he got it, but John thought he was just doing it to, to you know, to, uh, to, you know uh, to bust his balls. But uh, whatever. Anyway, we, we got the chord, and that was the only uh, thing that I noticed in the studio that, that pissed him off. But Phil was used to working slow. That album took five months, six months to make. Uh, a regular uh, Ramones album would take two and a half, three weeks to make. So it was a work ethic problem. So, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the times uh, he would yell at Dee Dee and, you know, Dee Dee would yell at him. And, you know, he's from the Bronx, they're from Queens, I'm from Brooklyn. So there was some kind of uh, chemistry there. <laughs> but... Um, it turned out the way it did. A lot of punk purists didn't like it when it came out because of the horns and the strings and the pe who knows what was in there, you know, on that, on that album. There's so many instruments. But they already did their three chord albums. So you got to change, you know, you got to change uh, sometimes, you know. But now as I look back, I, I appreciate it more because the Rock and Roll High School's on it, Rock and Roll Radio's on it, Chinese Rocks is on it. Danny Says is on it, so there's a lot of great songs on there, you know what I mean? But, uh, you know, it was an experiment. Thank God it, it was only that only experiment. And uh, we pressed on, moved on, you know? Right. So as the band's profile continued to build, you started kind of spinning out of control because the, the lifestyle uh, was just too much uh, for yeah. you. Yeah. So what happened in 1982? Well, what, ha what was happening was, to me, uh, I uh, was a very hyper person, still am, and uh, I found that alcohol calmed me down, you know? So uh, I liked drinking beer with the guys and the girls, whatever, and then it was the wine, and then I would wake up to martinis. Uh, I had a liquor store downstairs that would deliver, deliver, and that was very convenient. And eventually, I'd be drinking with the delivery guy, you know, he never went back to work, you know, so uh, uh, I did develop, a, I was a periodic, meaning you didn't drink every day, you just, but when you did, you did. So I never got high before I uh, recorded an album or did a show. Uh, but at this particular uh, session doing Subterranean Jungle, which was one of our albums, I didn't like the drum sound, didn't like the producer. Uh, and uh, it was kind of depressing because I didn't have a say in what was going on with my drum sound, uh, which I never had a problem with. But this guy was adamant. At the time, in 82, 82 and a half, uh, bands were using that drum machine sound, which I, I, I just didn't like because it, 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 there was no feel from the drum, from the shell, the tone, the, the rim shot, uh, just, just things. And uh, he just made it sound like that, and I got disgusted. That's why uh, I didn't do Time Has Come Today, which was one of the oldies that were on that album. But uh, I had a fifth of vodka in those garbage cans with the flap on it, where if you don't pull your fingers out quick enough, they get bruised. Uh, and the uh, bottle was in there. So I'm sharing it with Walter Lur who was the second guitar player with Johnny Thunder's Heartbreakers. 
So Dee Dee goes in there, and uh, Dee Dee wasn't really known to be an angel when it came to drugs, but um, he stuck his hand in there, pulled out the bottle, waved it around to everybody, and he goes, look what Mark's doing. So it was at that point, Dee Dee was the narc. And, uh, you know, he ratted me out. He was my best friend. You know, I just, I, I think it was the psych drugs that, that, that got to him. But uh, at that point, uh, uh, I was told to leave the, the band. Joey called me up. He said, you need help. And, and I understood. So for four years, I was out of the group uh, getting sober. Uh, I was uh, advised to do different kind of work because, uh, you know, there's other businesses besides the music business. So I wanted to stay physically fit. So uh, I did construction. I did demolition work. I put up wrought iron gates and crack houses. Crack houses were big at the time. And, and, and now they're condos. So, uh, you know, I don't know what's better. You know, anyway, I, I, had, to, uh, I had to do that. And then um, uh, I got a phone call after the fourth year that uh, Richie deserted the group and that Clem, who I love, uh, great with Blondie, but not a Ramones drummer. So then I got the call, we need you. Uh, and I understood what was going on, you know. So I came back, did 10 songs with the group, and it was like I never left. And the first song I did record was Pet Cemetery. Uh, for the Stephen King movie and soundtrack, and uh, that was it. Did you did you play any music during that, that, those four years? Well, yeah, I was in a, a band for about a year with uh, the guitar player, the Plasmatics, Richie Stotts, and um, we had a, a band together. We played the local clubs and stuff, but. Um, with uh, the style of music that we were doing, it was already getting played out. It was, it was like a metal band, you know? But uh, the Ramones uh, tour manager and John got in touch with me. So, uh, you know, after all the stuff that happened, I knew they were, they were you know, in a fix. So I just wanted to get back and just start playing those great songs again, you know? In the book, when you talk about your years working construction and doing demo, it's... You, there's kind of a, you romanticize it a little bit. You, did you actually enjoy kind of stepping out of the fray of the, uh, of the music touring business. and music business and actually breaking Well, it was different. Things? Yeah, it was different. You meet different people, different personalities, uh, different businesses. Um, and uh, you get up 5.30 in the morning. You got to be on that construction site. And uh, you meet, you know, you meet the workers there, you know, just, just regular guys, you know, doing what they got to do. And, uh, you know, the site was in Brooklyn, so I could relate to them, you know. And uh, it, it, I, had a, I, I got to uh, learn how to use different equipment uh, and uh, doc the demolition especially, you know, heat guns and sledgehammers and, you know, all these things. So I learned a lot, you know. So uh, if I ever had to you know, back then, lean back on something, I could do that. And not that much different from your drumming style, so it probably worked out well. <laughs> oh, physical was great. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, very, very cool. Destroying everything. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, cracking a few cymbals here and there. How were things different once you came back in the band? Were they any better or same? Well, when I got back in the band, and especially when I got, entered the van again, I turned around and there was Dee Dee. Uh, he was uh, Dee Dee King, and uh, he became a, a, a rapper. <laughs> and uh, great songs on that album. Some of those songs should have been on the Ramones albums. And, you know, the Mercedes chain, the Adidas jumpsuit. And he, and he started rapping in the van so many times that, I, that I, I, you know, I could have swore that he lost it, but he didn't lose it. The thing is this. He wanted to attempt to get into a new genre of music and, and more power to him. But Dee Dee was a punk rocker, you know, and uh, luckily we had him on board when he wasn't in the band to write, you know, so that, that's w why, you know, he was still uh, hanging around us, you know. But we remained friends. I remained friends with him until he passed away. 
Did you have to resume your role as kind of the diplomat between Joey and Johnny at I, that I, point? I, I didn't get involved anymore. It's like, uh, it, was, it was enough. You didn't I feel mean, responsible I, anymore? You know, I did enough already the first time, and, you know, I, you, know you, you gotta let live and let live. If people don't get along, there's nothing you can do. So I had to think about myself, you know, maintaining my, sobri my sobriety, making meetings, and that was number one. You know, so, uh, and making sure that I put in all my effort into my drumming to make sure that I did what I had to do up on the stage. So, no one was talking, and you guys are driving across the country. You didn't have iPhones to be on Twitter or whatever. What, no, was, we only what had, were those van rides we only like? Had maps. <laughs> you know? So, what was that just torture all those years in that van? No, it wasn't torture. Uh, I just would start reading. I ha we, again, I was signed Rose. We, if we wanted to sleep, we would just have our pillows and sleep on our, on our rows. But uh, we'd have the oldie stations on because the music at the time we really didn't like, you know, and uh, we would just uh, listen to the oldie stations. And John would have his uh, transistor radio with his one ear plug listening to baseball games. So that, that's how it was. How did... Or I should ask, why did the band stay together at that point? It sounds like no one was really happy and no one wanted to be there. What kept it together? Oh, we wanted to be there. We wanted to play. But it was just all at the preliminaries before we played. Uh, because at that point, the band was bigger and, you know, we were very happy that happened. So why let a good thing go? Right. And... Among the personality quirks in the band, you were dealing with, uh, Joey had OCD, where he you, you would have to sometimes just turn around the van around and go drive back hours because he needed to touch something. And well, it wasn't hours. There was just this one incident where we landed from Heathrow from London. And uh, he, he, taught, he was touching the curb. And then we drive back all the way to New York City from JFK Airport. And then the next thing you know, he tells our trusty tour manager, Monty, to go back to the airport because he had to touch that curb again. So that's how deep that went. But in the beginning, we didn't know what it was. No one really knew what it was. So uh, Johnny and Dee, Dee thought he was just doing it to, you know, bust there, whatever. And he wasn't. He, he, he was afflicted with that. And then I realized later that uh, guys, we got to be a little cooler with the guy, you know? And, and stop tormenting him. So uh, that, that's, what he would, that's what OCD does. And I was sitting next to him on a plane, and he would count the squares in the back of the fabric uh, of the seats and making sure that every thing that he counted was right. And if I interrupted him, he would flip out, you know, and he'd have to count it again. So after that, I made sure that Monty put me in a different seat, <laughs> you know. Because it's just, just the lunacy. I went through lunacy, too, getting sober and, you know, the DTs and the craziness. I had to, you know, I had to be a little uh, away from it, you know? And then John, you and Johnny had completely different politics, yes. and he was quite vocal about his politics. And he was a huge baseball fan, and you don't care about baseball. So you had to negotiate that whole relationship as well. Well, yeah, uh, Johnny, uh, I mean, it's, it's already known. He was an ultra-conservative. I was a de liberal Democrat, so was Joey. Dee Dee, I don't know. I don't think he followed, I don't think he, <laughs> I, I don't think he cared. A anyway, uh, so that again would create the animosities. Uh, John going, well, Reagan was the greatest president. Uh, Nixon, they shouldn't have, uh, you know, uh, uh, treated him the way they did. That was the liberal press. Uh, you know, he was so happy that George Bush won. So, you know, and, and we had to keep hearing this, you know, and uh, Joey being the liberal Democrat, me being the Democrat and all this stuff. And, you know, uh, again, you know, they were just uh, opposites, you know, and uh, we're, I guess, in this country, you know, we have a two-party system, and uh, whatever makes you happy, you know? At the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction, when um, Johnny, th did he thank George Bush? Oh, yeah. How, how, did that, how did that go over with the rest of the band? How did Not you feel about good. that? Not too good. 
There were, there were more groans than applause. Uh, I, I, I said to John, what did, what, what did George Bush do, do for your career? What did he do? You know, you could have thanked other people who, who helped your career, you know? So I think he just wanted to uh, irritate the liberal democratic music uh, establishment at that moment, which he, which he did, you know? But um, I thought it was inappropriate. I, I thought that he could have thanked other people that, you know, uh, you know helped with his uh, musical career. <laughs> that, that was the best. As he should have. Too. I, I, I was cracking up so much that, uh, you know, it, it was, uh, it, it, that was the moment of the night. You know what I mean? It was just, everybody was just dying laughing. This, all that aside, was it important for you and the rest of the band to get into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame to be recognized by th that group of people? Well, you know, you, you don't know until you find out. You know, they call you, oh, you're going to be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, we were very grateful because we were amongst our peers that we liked. The Beatles, the Kinks, the Who, uh, uh, Little Richard, Chuck Berry, uh, Fats Domino, Elvis Presley, uh, and all these great, you know, luminaries. And we were representing our genre of music, which is punk rock. So uh, finally, we were getting some kind of kudos uh, and being recognized at that level. So uh, we were happy to get in there, you know, uh, saying, hey, we, we, you know, we're punk rock, we're here with all you guys, so, you know. In, by your estimation, what was the Ramones' greatest contribution to rock and roll? I guess that sound, you know, that wall of sound, like, uh, you know, you know, it's the Ramones playing. It, it's that, that wall, you know, the tidal wave coming at you, you know, that, that it's, it's, it sounds like an army approaching, you know, uh, well, how we influence punk rock and uh, never changing, sticking to our guns and, um, people realize that, you know, all over the world. So, uh, you know, we always saw that, and uh, I guess that's, that's, what, that's our legacy, you know? When the band uh, decided to retire, um, when you guys all together made that decision, there was a period where you didn't want to play that music and you needed to kind of step away and do something else. Um, oh, yeah. I did two albums. Uh, with the band I was in, Originals. And uh, when I did tour, you know, the, there, was, there was applause, but they wanted to hear Ramon songs. So, you know, I, I, I knew I could never compete with the Ramones, obviously. So I said, okay, I know what, what you know, my fans and friends want to hear, so I just started continuing to play Ramon songs. That's what I continue to do now. I'm here to give them the you know, because they are great songs, and they're too good not to be played. So that's my intention, uh, as long as it's fun, and as long as my body permits. So I will continue doing it, you know. Thank you. You're touring now with uh, the singer Andrew W.K. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, I do. Tell me about him and how, how you met and what makes him the, uh, the right front man for these songs. Well, he, he knows how to engage an audience. It's 2015 now. It's a little different than 1976. Uh, he's very physical. He's a very positive person. And I, I like being around people like that. And he, and he puts his own slant on it. I, I didn't want Joey clone because nobody's going to be Joey. You know, uh, he, he was great at what he did. And uh, I would never expect anyone to be as great as him. So Andrew does it his way. And we do 36 Ramones songs around the world. And, I, and we've been to places that the Ramones never thought in a million years that, that they or I would be in Russia, China, Vietnam, uh, 
so, you know, it's a whole new world. It's one world now because of, uh, you know, the technology, the internet, the cell phones, and all this stuff. So they love our Western culture. They might not necessarily agree with our politics, but they like our culture. So uh, Andrew uh, just, again, just really gets the audience going. And, and, and I, I just love the guy's party philosophy. Not necessarily drinking or doing drugs, just enjoying each day at a time, and you're on this planet, and you're living it to your fullest, you know? Oh, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, we're, we're planning that. Uh, and you also do the Sirius your oh, yeah. radio show as well. Yeah, what? I have a show on Sirius XM for 10 years already. <laughs> Who knew how long, you know what I mean? <laughs> Just goes by. So I only play punk rock. I feel a lot of punk bands when they came out were overlooked just because of the term punk. Uh, but they, have, they had great songs, they were short and sweet, and I wanna, I wanna give them a chance again. And also newer punk bands that won't have a chance because of how the industry is now. And uh, if anybody is listening to the show, producer, record company, engineer, they might like that new band and maybe help them uh, get a record deal or start, you know, putting them on a tour with another group. So I, I play all eras of punk rock on my show, and I get to choose what I play. So that that that's important. That's great. I was I was gonna say so. You you're touring with the band. You have the book out. You do the serious ra radio show, and then you have your, your own line of pasta sauce and beer and uh, yeah. And hot, hot sauce, sauce yeah, as yeah. well, yeah. And yeah. you, and on the side, when yeah. you have time, you rebuild classic cars. Yeah, my uh, my grandfather was a chef at the Copacabana in New York, <laughs> and uh, the Twenty One Club. He used to cook for Jackie Gleason, the uh, Mobsters, uh, Humphrey Bogart, Betty Davis, and Jackie Gleason liked his steak an inch and a half thick, and uh, and the Mobsters trusted my grandfather co to cook for them. They they owned the place. So as a little boy, I would go to my grandfather's house with my parents and watch him cook. Uh, he, was, he was creative. He was a genius with a knife, you know? I don't know how he didn't get his fingers cut off. But uh, I would watch him. And then later on, when I got kicked out of my parents' house at uh, 18 years old, uh, I had to cook for myself. The cheapest thing was just getting spaghetti, tomato sauce, and you could eat it cold, too, and it tasted great cold. Like, look, sometimes cold pizza is better than hot pizza. So, uh, you know, the spaghetti would last four days, keep me going. And uh, that's, that, that's how I decided I wanted to start my own sauce, which uh, it took six months to make. Let me tell you, some of it was too salty, some of it was, was too thick, some of it was too thin, runny, and you have to get away from it. You have to wait. You have to leave, leave it alone for a couple of weeks, come back, try again. Finally, it worked. And why it worked, it was because of the tomatoes, you know, the, uh, the plum tomatoes. And it was the seeds that helped the consistency of the sauce. But, I, but what also I like about it, I got to choose where part of the proceeds goes to a charity, which goes to Autism Speaks, you know. And uh, thank you. M make, making that sauce sounds harder than being in the Ramones. <laughs> well, it's just uh, another creative thing, you know? I mean, uh, you see chefs on TV now, they're like rock stars. I became good friends with uh, Anthony Bourdain. I love the guy. Uh, the beer. Okay, I don't drink, so uh, it, it's, uh, it will be everywhere in the country. Not, not like the sauce, just in specialty stores. Uh, but uh, the beer. Uh, was developed in Spain. And now here they have the same ingredients that they're able to put it out. So I, like a wine taster, didn't swallow it. I tried it, spit it out, perfect. So I liked it. And another reason why I did it was because part of that charity, a part of the proceeds goes to uh, Musicians Without Borders. And it helps musicians. I wish I had that help when I was a kid, but you know, 
Somebody's got to do it, you know? Somebody has to do it. And the hot sauce, um, when it comes out here, it's, it's, it's already in, in Europe. Uh, when it comes out here, I want to give it to uh, the veterans that came home without limbs, you know, to help them out, you know? So, you know, if, if you're in that position uh, to do that, it's good to give back. You know, it sounds cliche, but that's what I wanted to do. Has, I should ask, has the sobriety been a challenge since you have so many things going on and since you end up playing in so many places that are serving alcohol? And well, you, you, lo you lose the urge. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not a preacher. Uh, you know, if a person wants to drink, that's, that's up to them. You know, you can't tell anybody what to do. They're not going to listen. I'm going to fuck you, you know what I mean? But they're not going to listen to you. You know, they're going to have to want it. You know, and it's available, AAA, NA, whatever, whatever it is. Uh, but you can't force somebody to do it. They, they got to want to do it. And um, I lost my urge. And uh, I still like the smell. But uh, like, like when you walk by a, a delicatessen, you smell the coffee. It's unbelievable, you know. But, but the booze, that's, that's, that's out of my life, you know. That's great. Are you hoping that this turns into a movie? Uh, I, I never thought of that, but uh, it's number one on Amazon and, uh, you know, rock, whatever you want to call it, rock autobiographies or punk rock or rock, whatever. Everything has to be categorized, you know. <laughs> anyway, uh, will it be a movie? I don't know. I keep hearing these rumors that Martin Scorsese is making a, a Ramones movie. I heard that five years ago. So um, uh, we, we will be sending a, a copy of that to him. And... <laughs> And, and when, I, when I see his signature on the contract, then I know it's for real, you know what I mean? But there are a lot of rumors in, 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 in all sorts of business and entertainment. So when it materializes, then I'll know for sure that uh, it'll be on the screen. Have you already picked out who you want to play you in the movie? No, I, didn't, I really didn't think about it yet. Uh, it's just all the stuff has happened so quick. I'm just so happy I finished with the book. <laughs> You know, if you ever saw the Jackie Gleason show where he goes, I got a big mouth. So it's all on paper, and that's the result. That's great. Um, I think we're going to take some questions from the audience. If... Can, can you put the lights down just a little bit? I can't see anybody. I'm like, yeah. I'm blind right. anyway, so but, have, uh, you know. We'll have microphones in each aisle, and you can come out to the aisle, and that'll speed things along. I'll take the first question right here on your left. Oops. Hi, Marky. Uh, I, when I was like 19 I years old. I can see old, again. Oops. I uh. saw you guys play uh, in Santa Clara at One Step Beyond. Uh, yeah, so it was like 1989, and I think it was Dee Dee's last show. Yeah, bra Brain Drain Tour. Yeah, yeah, so what was that like backstage, though? How did he, did you have any interaction with him? Or well, at least we knew about it. Uh, the, the, the drummer that replaced me just left, deserted the group. I, I had to hear about that for a year. In the van, again, which you can't escape. Yeah, you know, he, it was, he was my best friend, and him leaving, it was like... Oh, come on, you know, stay, stay. What are you going to do? The guy just wanted to leave. He, uh, he, you know, people change sometimes in life. You know, they move on to other things. So I, I, I wasn't going to stop him. Uh, he had a, a, a dream to become a, a rapper. So I wasn't going to be the one to stop him. I wished him luck. That was it. We always stayed in touch. And that's what mattered. Our friendship continued, you know. So I'm going to ask again if you have a question to come out into either aisle and form a line. Take the next question right here. Hi, Dean. Okay. You wrote about fashion slaves. Hello. How are you? Oh, there you are. Hi. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, I'm used to categories. I have a question um, for you, Marky. So the music industry has inevitably changed because of technology. Yes. Um, what are your thoughts about that? Do you feel like, sorry, it's not good. Do you feel like it's, um, do you feel like there's a way to kind of take that and uh, do you feel like it could benefit or do you think it hurts artists or do you think, because it's changing right now, nobody really knows what it is. 
um, what would be, do you, do you think it's benefiting artists or do you think it's not benefiting artists? Well, uh, and, and when we started CBGB's, there was just a phone booth, you know, and the village voice that got the word around about anything. Now you have the internet, you have cell phones, you have all this, all, all this communication, which gets the band's name out there. But do I like piracy? It's not going to affect me, because we, we already sold our albums and already did what we did. But for, for the younger musician, it might stifle them because the minute he puts out that album, it's going to be pirated, downloaded. And so how is that artist going to feel when that happens? So it could interfere with music and, and, and its creativity for the future if that continues. Um, you know, obviously the artist wants to make a living out of doing what he's doing. So uh, it, it might interfere in the future with creativity, which is sad because uh, there's a lot of budding musicians out there that are great. You know, we just don't know about them yet, you know? Your next question is over here, Mark. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, I, first of all, I want to say I'm a really big fan, and I've been listening to you and your band since I was in diapers. Um, is that dad over there? Um, is that your father? Oh, okay, I, uh, whatever. <laughs> it's great that they let you out at, uh, at yeah. this hour, at your young yeah. age, you know? <laughs> um, I have a question. So do you think that there's one song or one album that kind of encompasses the Ramones legacy? Oh, yeah, the first album. Oh, it's just, you know. I mean, when I first heard that, I didn't hear anything like that ever, you know? Uh, I was at uh, Max's Kansas City, Wayne County, who I played with, was a DJ there, and he played that first album, and I was living with a girl who had the album, and it was just, it just blew everything off the map. Uh, I never heard anything like it. It was, it was just so stripped down, and that, that's the album that should be in the time capsule, you know, that goes to the moon, you know, so. Enjoy your evening. <laughs> we have another one over here, Marky. Okay. I just have a question about your influences. What was the first concert you ever saw? What was the first album you ever bought? Well, my, the, it was 1964. I was playing my army soldiers and I, my helicopters and my army tanks uh, that I made. Uh, you know, they were models, and I used to use testers glue. And that's why I made them, because... <laughs> You know, I, while making the model, I felt great. <laughs> and, I, and I wondered why. And then, you know, it, it was obviously they banned it eventually. But anyway, uh, it was the Beatles. My parents had the TV in the living room, and they came on the Ed Sullivan show, and I uh, immediately started banging on everything. And, uh, you know, I drove my parents crazy, you know. And eventually I started putting together a drum set at a, at a young, young age. But my influences were Ringo, and I, and I listened to a lot of jazz in, in uh, my later teens. Uh, I liked Buddy Rich. I liked uh, Dave Brubeck, Take Five album. I liked uh, 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 Gene Krupa's stuff. I liked uh, Mitch Mitchell from Jimi Hendrix Experience, who was really a jazz drummer. I liked uh, uh, Ginger Baker, who was really a jazz, jazz drummer. Uh, and of course, John Bonham. I liked Hal Blaine from The Wrecking Crew, uh, Phil Spector's session drama. So, you know, that, that's what I was influenced by. I, I never closed my ears to different genres of music because I always wanted to learn. When you think you know everything, you're not going to learn nothing. So uh, I, uh, you know, learned from a lot of different people and Keith Moon. Next question is on your left. Oh, hi. It's, hey. good, it's good to be on the left. <laughs> hey, Marky, thank you so hi. much for being here, man. Um, big man. Uh, so kind of curtailing off of what the first guy asked um, about DD and stuff, how did you feel about, uh, you know, CJ coming into the band? And, you know, did you feel like he ever, you know, kind of filled his shoes in any way? Or did you ever have a good relationship with well, him? Well, no one can fill DD's shoes, believe me. Uh, without a doubt, but CJ did some good things in the band, and he was needed. How are we going to go on without a bass player, you know? 
Uh, I didn't particularly like his politics. They was similar to John's. But uh, he was from a different different era, the, you know, like uh, like the 80, like late 80s. But, uh, you know, he did what he had to do. He did it well. And uh, he, he was in the band for, I think, close to seven years. So... Uh, you know that that was it. You know he uh, we needed we needed him to be in the band. Thank you. Next one's over here on your right. Hi, on the right. Hi. So I remember you talking about how CBGB was your home, and well, I'm one of the people that you mentioned who never saw the '70s. Um, I was wondering how that changed when you went to the bigger sh to the bigger shows, the bigger venues. Well, every everything is different. You, you have your CBGBs, 300 people max, and then as you got bigger, you played other venues, thousand, twelve hundred. Then you start playing thousands and thousands. But you learn uh, from each venue uh, what happens. You know, you're closer to your fans. Then you, then the fans are far farther away. Then they're farther away. So you got to you got to play play well you're playing the same way but you you have to play to the crowd you know to a hundred thousand people like the us festival that we played to in 1982 uh it was different than playing cbgb's in front of 300 people obviously so uh you, you know you look at different things you instead of focusing on one person you focus on the whole thing or you look o over because it could be very overwhelming to play in front of that many people, you know? Uh, we, we never got nervous on stage, but, uh, you know, I could see that it could definitely be a little, you know, shaky, you know? But you learn from each uh, venue that you play. So that, that, was, that was really the difference. Next question on your left. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. Hi. Mark, you, oh, thank you. you. Know, pleasure to all, be here. First of all, I want to say, I want that jacket. <laughs> um, Thank you. <laughs> you know, I remember back in the day when punk first started to come out, first started to hit, uh, there was a lot of anger. You know, there was a lot of anger from people who couldn't give up their Pink Floyd, couldn't give up their Zeppelin. Um, I think I read in a book about Warhol, Andy Warhol, that uh, some chapter that Dee Dee got jumped or beat up or something like that in the streets. I wonder, did you guys ever run into like any aggression or any anger when you guys were touring in the early days? People who wanted to fight or oh yeah, just, yeah. You know, was there kind of yeah? I'm from Brooklyn. Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was coming out of Max's Kansas City one night. I was with Kisses, Roadie, and uh, my brother. I see these two guys fighting. One guy was about six three. The other guy was about five eight. I said, "There's something wrong here." Why is this big guy beating up this little guy? So here I am, you know, I come out of Max's, I come in between them to stop the fight, uh, me, the, uh, the good Samaritan. So the little guy stabs me. <laughs> here I am trying to protect the little guy. He's the one that stabs me. So I get stabbed under the arm. I got, had to be rushed to the hospital. I got cauterized, it hit a, hit a big artery there. So stuff like that happens, you know. It happened a lot in New York, in, in Brooklyn and New York. And you know, a lot of people I know in Brooklyn were raised that way. You know, it's I don't want to get into that because you never know who's listening. But uh, that that's the culture I grew up around, you know. But uh, the funny story about Dee Dee, he had a big scar uh, near his stomach, and he 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 said a lot of times that he got of fighting in Vietnam. <laughs> and the other story is that he really did get into a knife fight, but that was just a scar because he got his appendix taken out. <laughs> so that was Dee Dee for you, you know? That, that's why I loved him, you know? But uh, yeah, there, there, there were a lot of uh, con uh, physical confrontations. Next one's over here. Hi. Hi, first of all, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I was influenced a lot with music from my pop, who was 40 when he had me, so it was a lot of old-fashioned stuff until Good. I heard um, Rock and Roll High School, and then I got a lot of connections with friends. But when he passed, I couldn't even listen to anything for a few years, and now I find myself kind of sounding like him, like, what is this noise? I don't hear anything on the radio that I like. Is there anything 
Any particular bands that you can kind of tell us that well, you Well, being on, support? being, uh, having my radio show, uh, I, I, I want to hear new bands, you know. There's a, in my genre, there's bands like the Gallows from London. Great, uh, they were, I think, yeah, they are the premier new punk band there. There's the Loved Ones. There's uh, the, the individual members of Rancid, what they're doing, and their latest album's great. Um, I uh, like Anti-Flag. There, there's a lot of good stuff there. You just gotta, you just gotta find it, you know? Uh, the, there's this, uh, especially on Sirius XM, there's so many stations, you know? So uh, there is good stuff. You just, gotta, you just gotta find it, you know? Next question on your left. Hi. I just wanted to ask, uh, I really liked what you were saying earlier about how it seems like a lot of people today who, like, didn't grow up in the same area you did, they kind of tend to romanticize the, uh, the era, but they don't really think about the, the social economic environment that kind of gives you a lot of unique challenges. And I was wondering, what's your take on some of the unique challenges that new and up and coming artists are facing today? Well, ob obviously the downloading, the piracy, and I mentioned that before, that uh, it could definitely stifle creativity for the future. So we'll either end up with the music we know now, or eventually it'll, there won't be anything, you know? So hopefully there'll, there'll be a way where this can, you know, where these, these musicians can continue to strive. You know, when, when I started out, I lived in a basement apartment and I needed a padlock to get into my door, cement floor, no hot water, uh, no heat, and right beneath the window, I, I lived in a basement apartment, no heat, and then there was uh, where everyone threw the garbage, right under my window. So that, you, sometimes an artist has to go through that and live that kind of life to appreciate what he's accomplished, you know? So that's, that's, a, that's a two, uh, two answer to one, one question. Next Hi. Hi. Um, just tell me, why do you play rock music? Why do I play rock music? Because uh, I'm not Philip Sousa. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I, res I respect everybody's uh, tastes, but uh, I think I, I play rock music the best, you know? Uh, I'm not, I, I'm not, I'd love to know how to read and play jazz, but, but I can't. I tried. It's very difficult. Ja jazz is a whole nother form. There's, you have your different time changes, 5-4, 6-4, this, that, and it's like after a while, it's, you know, my brain isn't developed enough for that stuff, <laughs> you know. Uh, whatever the reasons, I stick to 4-4 four, four and 2-4. So, right. thank you for bringing up that question. And this will be our final question. How long did you know Joey was sick? Well, uh, our last show uh, was 96 in California. And about a year later, uh, a guy approached us to do a show in uh, Argentina, this huge 60,000 capacity stadium, and was a million dollar offer. He came by with, a, with thousands of signatures. So we discussed it. Joey didn't want to do it. John wanted to do it, and I wanted to do it. But uh, uh, Joey didn't want to do it. And everyone thought that Joey was doing it despite John, his last stab. But he already started having the signs of the cancer. So that was probably the reason, because you had to start with the chemotherapy and all that stuff. So, uh, you know, life throws blows at you, you know, curveballs. So it really sucked when, when he, you know, got afflicted with that. So, uh, you know, um, I think if we had, if Joey didn't get the cancer and we had a four year rest period, we might have gotten together again and did a reunion like every other band, you know what I mean? So I hope I answered the question. Sometimes my, my, my brain wanders, you know. <laughs>
Um, we're gonna move into the lobby now, and you're gonna sign some books. And yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna go take a leak. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll be there in a few minutes. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.